the paranormal to the extraordinary, from the weird to the wonderful, this is On The Odd. Pretty well. Good to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I um, just want to say Ian was a member, um, or, or you, I'm not sure where you actually stand with the um, Mormon Church. Um, are you still part of the organization? Or um, that's know? a good question. Actually, I guess technically my name is still on the records of the church. I haven't had my name removed from the records. Okay. Um, but I would con- I would not consider myself to be a Mormon anymore. No, you say the records. Are there mm-hmm. um, is there an entire like database of Mormons? Uh, yeah, just the you know the records of the church. Um, oh, okay. So when you join the church, whether if you've grown up in the church or uh, if you convert to Mormonism, you get baptized, and once you're baptized, you're officially a member of the church and, uh, you have a record and everything. Um, and so a lot of people, when they leave the church, you can kind of just leave the church and, it's and like forget about it in that sense where you can, you could find a new church and it's no big deal. You don't have to have something transferred or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but there's still that record there and they still consider you a, a member Mm-hmm. of the church, but you can, you can, uh, go through the process of having your name removed from the records and everything. But if you were I to say done, move, I haven't done that. If you decided to move to, I, I live in Long Island. I realize uh-huh. there's actually there's quite a few, um, Latter-day Saints and uh, Mormon, um, churches around more than I expected yeah. actually. And yeah. we, um, so you'd be able to do that. You could just kind of go into one and say, Hey, I'm new to the neighborhood and I want to can, you know, continue my faith here mm-hmm. okay yeah and, and the mormons are actually really good at kind of keeping track of their members so like uh if you move and they kind of know where you are they'll move the records to whatever group is closest to where you live now what's in the records um, uh, have, i mean is this a physical uh, record like it's on your yeah it's a it's a physical record it has your information your family information it has the date of your baptism the date of the different ordinances that you go through right um and uh i don't know if there's other information on there but uh it's just kind of yeah just your membership record keeps track of Mostly, I think it's the ordinances, your family, mm-hmm. um, stuff like that. I guess in a lot of ways, it's you know, it's a good organizational type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how um, long how long were you with the Mormons? Is this something you were born into? Yep. So I was born and raised. Uh, so but how old are you? If you don't mind me asking, I'm 35. Oh, okay, younger than me. And uh, uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, born and raised in the in the church, and right. uh, grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, the you know the heart of of Mormondom there. Yeah, and uh, lived there most of my life, and uh, born and raised in the church, and I left the church. Uh, I guess it's been about a year and a half now. Oh, so it's, I mean, it's relatively so pretty new. recent. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. And yeah. did something? I mean. I'm going to say probably just like everyone else in the whole world, when you're going through your teenager years, you're you're rebelling. And Mm -hmm. um, I mean, was this a period of time where you kind of thought, you know, what am I doing? Or is it something where you were really embracing it? You know what I I ask? Because I live in a very Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. 
And although I'm a Jewish person, uh, the Orthodox or the um, Hasidic, they're a lot more extreme. They, you know, they, um, they practice every holiday and there are a lot of them. Um, So, but you'll meet a kid who's like 14, 15 years old. And although he's rebelling, maybe in his own way, he's totally into Judaism. Yeah, I know what you mean. So, yeah, growing up for me, you know, every, everybody has kind of a different experience in in that whole process. Um, For me, you know, as a teenager, I kind of just, I I would guess I say in general, I believed uh, the tenets of the church. Mm -hmm. I went to church. I never made a a fuss of like not going to church or anything like that. Um, There's a lot of rules in the Mormon church, which a lot of people have probably heard about. Um, not as strict as uh, Orthodox Judaism, right. but uh, <laughs> but a lot of people make fun of Mormons for uh, you know certain things that they're not allowed to do. Well, I'd say um, they're pretty easy targets but, uh, when it comes to that. I, I think there's a lot exactly, of cheap shots yeah. actually. Definitely. Um, you know, th- I think the first thing that people are really kind of um, taken back by is um, you know their undergarments. Um, yeah, and we and can, what is we can the get into that. Word on that. You know, what what do you call those? Yeah, so let me let me uh, let me back I'm up sorry, just a little, I'm and I'll get into that. You, it's okay. It's I okay. also have my new poodle that's running around the house. And I don't know how he got up here in my office. Oh but, yeah. So I'm just gonna that, um... <laughs> that can be distracting. My kids, are, my wife and kids are out of town today, so oh. I don't have that distraction. So <laughs> it's nice to have a nice quiet house. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, as a as a teenager, I was uh, in the church, you know, went to all the things, uh, you know, I'd say generally I believed it, but didn't really follow all the rules, uh, went through my rebellious stage in junior high and high school. Right. Um, but eventually, you know, uh, near the end of high school, I kind of came back in line, uh, started more following the rules and, uh, decided to go on a mission. That's, you, you know, about Mormon missionaries, I'm sure. Yes. So I, I went on a mission for two years. Um, and that was when I was 19, came back, um, uh, a few years after I was back, got married, had kids and everything, but yeah. So I had my rebellious stage. Um, but, uh, most of my life, I would say it pretty much followed the tenets of the church there. Um, so throughout so your twenties you and everything, about... yeah, I mean, throughout your twenties, you're basically following the church. Um, and did you meet your wife through the church and you know, all that? Kind yeah. Of... So, um, yep. I got back from, uh, when you go on a mission, by the way, if I ever mission... bring up anything that's a little too personal, just, you know, just let me know. I mean, I'm not going to. Okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah. So in the Mormon church, all male members are expected to serve a mission. Mm-hmm. Um, women, if they want to, they can, but it's not really expected of them. Uh, More men, of an it's elected expected. type of thing. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So the men, they're expected to go and serve for two years, and uh, you don't get to choose where you go. Uh, you just say, all right, I'm ready to go. And they, you send in some paperwork and they tell you where you're going to be for the next two years. Um, and when you're done with that, uh, so I was, I left, left when I was 19. Uh, so I was 21 back, when I got uh, from home. from the mission when you were 19? Uh, left when I was 19, got oh, back uh, around 21. Gotcha. And when you leave the mission, uh, they tell you your next uh, assignment, basically your next obligation is to get married. It's, it's stressed, uh, pretty highly that, okay, now you're done with your mission. Now it's time to get married, start your family. Wow. Uh, the Mormon church is very family centric Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's kind of your obli, your obligation is to, you know, get married and start a family. Now is it about populating the world with Mormons? Or is uh, partially, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the old doctrines of, uh, you know, we believe in a pre-earth existence before we came here. So we, you know, in the church, we believe that there's uh, spirits waiting in heaven to come down and get a body. Now you're saying we believe um, as in a current uh-huh. tense, you know, is this, uh, is this still well, your faith and your belief? It's not my faith and belief. What? Whatsoever. It's just, I guess it's just uh, easier to say it that way. Yeah, no, I got you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
yeah, currently I would consider myself more of uh, basically an agnostic atheist. Gotcha. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I just kind of refer to it that way, I guess, since I'm, I guess uh, technically I'm still a Mormon now, since you, I'm on the record, but. Did, I mean, were there a number of things that happened where you were losing your faith over a period of time or there was, um, and, and you know what, sometimes when people say you're losing your faith, it almost seems like a personal attack. And I don't mean it like that. I mean it more yeah, along yeah. the lines of, okay. you know, the faith itself letting you down. Yeah, you know, maybe not doing what um, you were sold. You know, you sold this exactly. one particular bill of goods, and you're not getting it. <laughs> no, that's a that's a great question. Uh, it's really funny. I I went to this um, atheist meetup group just the other day, and I told you know was, we were kind of all sharing stories, and I told the group, oh yeah, I used to be a Mormon. I just left recently, and all of them were like how could you even be a Mormon in the first place? Don't you know Joseph Smith was just a fraud? Like, everybody knows Joseph Smith was a fraud. How did you not know that? Again, such a cheap and, shot, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, all right, it, it's not the oldest religion in the world, but they are all started kind of in a very similar way. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's it's one of those things, like you said, um, I grew up in the church. It was what I was taught my whole life. But um, it came to a point, you know, it was a, some people will leave the church pretty quickly. For me, I was a very devout follower, a full 100% believer. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, I was very into reading the scriptures, reading the history of the church, um, a, a lot of that stuff, because I took it pretty seriously. And um, as I got more and more into reading history, historical things of the church, I realized, okay, there's some issues here that aren't quite what I was taught my whole life. You know, I went to church, I went to seminary in, in high school, you take an hour out of school every, every day to go learn about the church. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I went to, I did everything that you're supposed to do, all the classes and everything. There's all this stuff now that I'm reading, you know, started about, it was about a five year long process for me. Um, of delving into the history, realizing I mean, it really, that, it really sounds a lot like um, a Pentecostal Christian, because yeah, what they do uh -huh. is you know they really dedicate their time to Bible study, um, or even Baptists tend to um, to study very deeply in their own church, um, uh, their own scriptures. Now you're talking about the Book of Mormon, right? And that is uh, your Bible. We use uh, so we have. Let's see, one, two, three, four books of Scripture. Um, okay. The Bible would be considered two, so Old, no, and Old New, Testament, Old Testament oh, okay. and New Testament. Uh, we have the Book of Mormon, so that'd be the third one, and then we also have something called, uh, I guess there's two more, um, something called the Pearl of Great Price and something called the Doctrine and Covenants. So those are, when we say Scriptures, it could be any or all of those. Mm -hmm. um, so... We believe all of those things, or I guess Mormons, I should say, uh, believe that all of those are uh, the Word of God. And um, so, yeah, the Book of Mormon is just one one of many scriptures. Uh, and I can give you a, kind of a brief outline of where they come from, if if you want to hear that. Or, sure. I mean, um, you know, that's what I would love to have you do is, you know, I guess basically explain it for people who might have no experience in Mormonism. Is that okay. And, yeah, let me, yeah, so let me maybe go over kind of the core doctrines. Real, I'll try to be brief, but, um, and then that'll, that'll make it really clear for you. So the core beliefs in Mormonism is that, uh, I kind of wrote down a few things here for my notes. Um, cool. We believe, you know, the, the church church members, I should say, uh, believe that, you know, there is a, a God uh, who is a man with a flesh and bones. Uh, we believe in the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. And then we believe that there's this truth that God revealed the gospel to Adam and Eve in the garden, right? The mm -hmm. first, first people. 
and they had the true gospel. Now, is this a literal belief? Literal belief. Yep. Okay. All right. They uh, God created Adam and Eve literally. They lived in a garden. It's all full literal belief there. Mm-hmm. And um, the rib and everything, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, and if you get really into it, the Garden of Eden was in Missouri. But we'll we'll skip all that stuff for now. <laughs> I don't even mean to uh, laugh at that. I mean, why not? You know, why yeah, shouldn't why it not? be in Missouri? <laughs> exactly. It could be anywhere, right? Right. Um, and so there's this truth. And then Adam lives his life. And eventually the people kind of lose the truth. Things get uh, diluted and changed over time. And the truth is lost. And so God calls another prophet. Uh, the next one would be Enoch. And he re- restores the truth back to the earth. And that's why he's such a great prophet. And then this, this cycle of apostasy continues. So they bring, they bring back the truth to the earth and eventually things get diluted and lost and changed. And then it's lost again. They calls another prophet. So we have this cycle of prophets. So it goes Adam, Enoch, Noah, Moses. Um, and then, you know, Moses restored it, you know, the whole children of Israel, everything. Um, got them to the promised land, and then things get diluted and distorted again. And so Christ comes to set that all back in order and fixes things again. So he's uh, not only a prophet along that same timeline, but the Son of God, so much more than just a prophet. Um, and then, but then, uh, according to the church, that truth again was lost after Jesus' time. Um, that it was distorted, things were taken taken away, things were added and changed, and so then we ended up, you know, with all these different churches, everybody believing different things. So what is the real truth? And that's where Joseph Smith comes in. He, uh, you know, the belief is that he, God, and Jesus Christ, who both are personages with a body of flesh and bone, living up in heaven. Um, they came down and personally visited with him and charged him to be the next prophet to restore the truth back to the earth mm-hmm. and, um, and start a new church um, to bring not just the truth, but the authority to act in God's name, which and is a big thing. that was in thing. 1830, right? Or in the early 1800s. Um, yep, yep. So his vision was in the late 1820s or somewhere in around 1820-ish. Uh, I'm bad with dates. But the church was officially established, yeah, 1830. I mean, so we're getting close to a bicentennial. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, that's something, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, And so now the the belief is that the church is going to, you know, the truth was restored to the earth. It's going to grow and grow and grow, and eventually it will fill the world. And the, the purpose now is to prepare the world to preach the gospel to as many people as possible, to all the world, and prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And so that's the goal of the church, is to uh, just teach everybody about the truth that has been restored, um, because everybody else out there, all the other churches, uh, they have some truth. Every church, you know, that's that's one of the, the things that I actually really loved about Mormonism was we believed in taking all truth, uh, wherever, whatever source it comes from, we believe in all truth. So, we, you know, the, the church constantly, I was taught that truth exists everywhere, but we take the truth from all sources and combine it into one full truth. So who's to and say what's true and what's not? Which exactly. is where I think it gets very complicated. You know, it it's does, always, definitely. It is strange. You know, over the years, you know, you do have the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, all written by men. You know, same thing, the Torah mm-hmm. was written by men at yeah. some point. Um, and change, you know, this King, the King James Version, you know, there's yeah. um, where stuff does get altered. And I can't, you know, I, I kind of had a conversation with somebody who, um, they were a fascinating person, they were born again Christian. Uh-huh. And I said, well, how do you know that, you know, this, that what you're reading, which was re- physically written by man, yeah. that it's accurate. That's the word of God. You know, you're, you're saying it's the word of God mm-hmm. interpreted by man. And 
they basically just go to their mat. You know, they basically call it magic in a lot of ways. God yeah. wouldn't allow it to be altered or it would always go back to the way it was, would normally be like, you know, like memory foam or something. Yeah. And I yeah. just never understood that. I, I think that's where all of these organized religions, including my own fall apart. Yeah, and that's see that's where Mormonism solves all the problems. Oh, <laughs> According no. What are you exactly. trying to do? Sell me to this? <laughs> well, I'm just I'm taking it I'm from kidding. I'm sharing it from a believer's perspective. I got gotcha. um, but yeah, that's that's exactly where Mormonism has the answers. So what we say is that uh, we believe the the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. But then the other scriptures are the word of God because, so the Book of Mormon was translated. The Book of Mormon is apparently uh, a record of um, Jewish people living in Jerusalem 600 years before Christ who escaped before the the city was attacked or taken over or whatever. And they came, they sailed across the sea to uh, America. And, uh, and this wow. is a record... Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> exactly. You didn't know your uh, people were that I didn't know. <laughs> were seafarers, huh? <laughs> no, I, <didn't. laughs> well, I say that in jest. Our, but, yeah, us dark, us dark yeah, skinned yeah. Afro uh, Jerusalem. Um, yeah, Mormons. exactly. So the Book of Mormon <laughs> is the record of the the Jewish, the Hebrew people in America wow. in ancient times. Wow. Who whose descendants eventually became the American Indians? So. It's a record of those people and what happened to them. And, uh, and so Joseph, you know, he found, apparently, uh, God told him, an an, well, an angel appeared to him and told him where these gold plates were, you've probably heard about. So Wait, he goes and... I just ask you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh-huh. Those seafaring people were Jews. So, yeah. Um, but there's no, there's no um, correlation between Judaism and Native American cultures like or languages no. like Lakota or Exactly. Does that get explained or is it just uh, eh, the well, Jews got bored and they <laughs> decided so to you're, live off you're the land. Exactly right. There is absolutely no correlation whatsoever. Yeah. But when you grow up with that taught your whole life, there's lots of little Sure, even Christopher they, they, Columbus, you know, it's like we we believe this up to a point, you know, or I did. Exactly. <laughs> so the way we're taught it is that there are these little correlations and, you know, there's these different things that make sense and uh, whatever. And, it, it, you know, getting into the history, I learned, OK, yeah, there's absolutely no correlation there. Yeah, we but, wouldn't have been able to handle the winters. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's no there way. No, no way. There's a lot of complaining <laughs> yeah. people. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, there is no evidence for that whatsoever, but the church, uh, finds all these little nuanced ways to find little things. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, the church still believes that as a literal thing. Um, and, uh, so yeah, Joseph found the gold plates, which were the records kept by those people and translated it. And that's how we got the book of Mormon. So, um, and that's the Book of Mormon. Then there's the other scriptures are the Doctrine and Covenants. Those are Joseph Smith's uh, direct revelations from God that were written down. Now, he so, translated something through a special pair of glasses, from what I remember. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I do know a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the but, glasses. You know, uh, but the glasses, um, whatever, I mean, were the glasses ever, um, like, are they a relic? Like, do they exist? Nope. No. All right. Same so thing with none, a lot of this stuff. Yeah, none of the relics exist except one that I can think of. So uh, apparently when he found the plates, he, he opened, he, you know, dug up a rock on this hill in upstate New York. Um, you know, where, dug up do, this... Where in New York, actually, if you don't mind? Do you know? Uh, I'm, I'm on Long Island, I should so. know this. It's upstate it New out. York. Um, the Book of Knowledge will know it. Google. It's the Hill Camorra. <laughs> the Hill Camorra. But I don't know exactly where that is. It's upstate New York. Um, Palmyra, I think, I want to say. Somewhere near Palmyra. I'm really bad with... Uh, That's all right. Um, names, names and dates, but... Yeah, Palmyra. Palmyra. I don't know where that is. Yeah, so that's where Joseph was living at the time. I was going to um, say how far it is from my house. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
Road there's trip. a if you go there, there's a bunch of uh, like, you know, stuff dedicated to the whole thing. Um, I've never been there, but uh, but yeah. So he goes and the angel tells him to go to this hill. He digs up a rock, finds the gold plates under a rock, along with a sword. A famous sword from the story of one of those people, and in there are these glasses apparently as well. That um, the glasses are called the Urim and Thummim, which I think is in the Bible. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's it's what he it was supposed to be used for translation. But later on, when you get into the translation story, there's a whole bunch of uh, he didn't actually really use those. He had a rock. Um. We call it a seer stone. Most oh, other yeah. people will call it a peep stone. Um, but this rock that he found that before he found the plates, and see, this is all new stuff that I had never heard before until a couple of years ago. But uh, really, as a this ble- isn't something they taught. The whole plates and everything, and translate. We were taught that he found the plates, and God inspired him as he read the plates to translate it, and he translated it. And he used the the glasses sometimes to maybe help him with that. But Mm -hmm. uh, what really, you know, if you read the actual history of what happened, he had this rock that was supposed to be like a seeing, a seer stone or a a seeing rock where he could see things in the rock. And according to the record, he put the rock in a hat to block out the light. He put his head in the hat. And he would read the words off the rock to translate Tommy, it. it. I mean, it really sounds like a lot of like mysticism, a lot of Definitely. things that people were very afraid of at this time. Well, yeah, maybe and not exactly time, at the time, but um, yeah, def- East Coast. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, go upstate, and it's about six hours from my house. Yeah, There's, okay. You, know, you go up there, we'll and that's near Rochester. And, yeah. Rochester is actually really beautiful. Um, but yeah, I never knew about this place. You know. Yeah, it's a. a it's a very uh, important place in Mormon history. The Sacred Grove is is near there. That's where apparently God and Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph, and when he was a fourteen year old boy, and you know basically said that he was the one to restore the church and everything. And so, yeah, it's it's a very important place uh, in Mormon uh, history, and you know, it's a lot of people go there. A lot it's of Mormons like the go Israel there every year. Of, uh, Mormons. Yeah, yeah, in a sense. <laughs> it really exactly. is, right? It, it is. Or yeah. Jerusalem, at least. Yeah, exactly. And um, so it's a very important place. Okay. But uh, should buy real estate there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always thinking, like, how can I make a quick buck? Um, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, all right, so you're going on with all of this, and you said you learned a lot of this stuff um, only more recently in the past few years. Um, is this the kind of stuff that led you to maybe a path leaving the church? Yeah, what very, um, what started me on the path actually was nothing in the history. What started me um, reading more into things was uh, just kind of, you know, going to church, reading my scriptures, reading the New Testament, things that Jesus taught. Because, you know, even though everybody else will say we're not Christians, that really offends Mormons. We'll, we'll say, oh, of course we're Christians. We believe in Christ. He's like the whole center of our theology. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're just, you know, we have a different belief than most Christians. So that's why people will say we're not Christian. But uh, um uh, but yeah, so I was, I was just reading the new Testament and I would read these words of Christ and say, you know, our church doesn't really follow the teachings that Christ taught. And we're not very Christian, accor- at least according to what he's teaching here. We're very, I feel like the Mormon church is very pharisaical. It's all about the little rules and making sure you do everything right. Instead of, you know, and Christ taught a lot against that. He was fighting against that. And uh, so that's kind of what started it for me. And so I started reading more into, you know, different talks from past leaders and, and past talks. And, uh, and then that led me back further and further back into the history of what previous prophets in our church taught um, leading me back to more back to Joseph Smith and realizing, oh, there's all these things that uh, 
that the previous prophets of the church taught that we don't teach today. So why is that? You know, why do they, why did they teach this? And now we don't talk about that anymore. And so I started reading more and more history and learning about all these different changes that occurred over time. Right. And that's never uh, good. Whenever there's changes yeah. in general, <laughs> it, it becomes a very, it becomes a very scary thing. Um, just because yeah. you're wondering, all right, change is great. Okay. But what was changed and is it more, is it still accessible? Yeah. And then it became, okay, well, you know, and our, one of the core beliefs of our church is that, uh, God called the prophet. So Joseph was the first prophet, but after he was killed, you know, God called the next prophet of the church and the, the prophet is the leader of the church, but they talk with God directly and they lead the church based on what God wants them to do. So, so as I read these past teachings, I would say, okay, so God is teach, telling this prophet what to say. Mm -hmm. This is what he's teaching. But then later on, he tells us the exact opposite. So which one, what is God actually trying to tell us? Is it this or this? They, it can't be both of them. Right. It's, there's contradictions and because man wrote it. And <laughs> Exactly. And so that led me down this whole thing of, you know, I, and it, it took, it was about a five year process of really delving into the history, tracking the changes, trying to figure out what was real, what wasn't. Um, now, when you, you know, were doing that research, were you, uh -huh. do, did you see like the writing on the wall? Did you think this is, you know, it's getting worse by the day kind of thing? Because you were probably uncovering quite a bit of stuff that was making you kind of question your own personal faith. Yeah. And maybe even, um, and maybe even just kind of regretting that, you know, you, you have spent so much time with this group, but at the same time, you know, uh, yeah, you that know, it, actually... can't, it couldn't have all been terrible, but I mean, it's, Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to see your yourself and actually be able to judge yourself critically. Definitely. Yeah. And that actually didn't happen for a number of years um, because, you know, I mentioned when I was uh, younger in high school, I was kind of rebellious, uh, didn't really follow all the rules, liked to party and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, which, you know, Mormons don't uh, allow you yeah, to they party, don't party really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and, uh, so, but that what changed me was, you know, when I was uh, 18 years old reading the Book of Mormon and I kind of had this experience that uh, I felt like God had talked to me and, and told me that it's true and that I need to go on a mission and all this stuff. So uh, that experience really kept, uh, kept the faith for me, even as I was going through this process, because I said, okay, there's all these issues that have changed, but at least I know the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith was a true prophet. I know all these things are still true, but it's changed since then. So actually what happened first in this process is I, I came to the conclusion that, okay, well, the modern church has strayed from what the early prophets taught. What Joseph originally taught, the modern church has strayed from that. So the modern church maybe is an apostasy, but Joseph Smith is still correct and the Book of Mormon is good and all this. And it wasn't until about five years into the process that I really took a serious look at Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. And then as I got into that, I, I mean, I can remember it hit me like, I don't even know how to explain it. It hit me like a ton of bricks all in one moment when I was just reading this document that was going through talking about some of the things in the Book of Mormon. And I just had this thought pop into my head that said, you know, all of these issues that you have with this church and trying to make everything fit, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> yeah. We call it, we call it mental gymnastics, trying to make all these different things fit, even though they don't make sense. And I said, you know, is it possible that Joseph just made this all up from the beginning? And as soon as I had that thought, it was just perfect clarity, just like a, it felt like I had like came out of the clouds and could see clearly. And it just, everything fit into this perfect puzzle of, with just that one thought. And I said, okay, it's all just complete BS from the beginning. And, uh, and that's what did it for me. And you know, it's, it's not too difficult to say that about, um, all organized religions. I mean, it's, yeah, 
Um, although, you know, I, I do follow my own religion. I think I do it mostly for my family. I, you know, I have a mm-hmm. kid. Um, and it's more about, at least for me, it's more about um, the togetherness of family and it's more about rituals, I guess. Like yeah, you know, yeah. these type of things that you just, you do. And mm-hmm. it's not so much that um, I believe on any level about an afterlife or a past yeah. life or a next life. Because the reality here with me personally is, uh, you know, sadly, I, I believe we're like plants, you know, we die, you know, it's, yeah. we, uh, we're here to live our lives and, and that's it, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. and for, and when people, they get kind of really into their religions where, and I, I know that it, this is another thing when it comes to a lot of religions um, and Mormons are definitely into this, um, and that's giving a certain percentage of your funds oh, to definitely. the church or to, you know, a synagogue or um, it's in all organized religions to support them. Yeah. And on some level it makes sense, but I, I don't know. I just always felt unless you're well to do, you really shouldn't have a certain guilt <laughs> associated yeah. with not being, you know, not just throwing money at this. Um, remarkably financed um, organization mm-hmm. you know, or do what you can do. You know, you can still participate in things and help it along without paying money. Yeah. Um, even though I'm not a big fan of you too anymore. Um, I just find Bono a little bit hard to swallow. <laughs> um, yeah. He did have, you know, one of the early U2 songs where he's like kind of up there preaching about something or another He's saying how um, the God he believes in isn't short on cash. So yeah. I think that that applies to all, not not Mormons, in you know, specifically, but yeah. every single religion out there that asks you, hey, you know, everything's going to be great, and here's an envelope. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, what you brought up about, you know, you're you're Jewish and you kind of – like you said, you may not believe all the tenets of, of Judaism, especially not the Orthodox, it sounds like. Sure. No. But, uh, but you know, you kind of go for the family aspect, the community, the ritual. Sure. Um, Mormonism is very tough to do that um, because in the Mormon church, it's kind of, they, they set it up as it's kind of an all or nothing church um, because it is the truth. Um, it's the only way to get to heaven, even though many people will say, no, every church, every church is good and can help you down that path. But, you know, we don't do baptisms for the dead for no reason. We believe you have to be baptized by the proper authority that only Mormons have to get into heaven. Um, so wait, you baptize so, people after the fact. Exactly. Because now, do you the, mean like ancestors from 400 years ago or? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh-huh. And that's why uh, the church has caught some flack from it from uh, from the Jewish people actually a few times because of baptizing you know Holocaust victims and things like that mm-hmm. um, because in the in our in our uh, doctrine I keep referring it as if I'm still a Mormon even though I'm not but it's no, just I, I habit it. <laughs> sure. but uh, in the doctrine it's uh, so along with when Joseph restored the truth, one of the one of the main things that was restored was what we call the priesthood power. And priesthood is the authority for men to act in the name of God. And to go to heaven or the high, you know, we believe there's different degrees of heaven. Um, but to get to the highest heaven, you have to be baptized by the proper authority. You have to go to the temple and be sealed to your wife and your family by the proper authority. So the ceiling is like creating a chain from, uh, from me to my children, but then also back. So from me to my parents, to their parents, to their parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's the family, you know, the heavenly family and you have to be baptized by the proper authority. You have to be sealed by the proper authority to be able to go to that, uh, the highest heaven. And, and so, what if you're not? Is there a purgatory? If you're not, um, then, you know, so you being Jewish, since you're not uh, part of our church, 
and uh, you haven't been baptized the correct way. I've never been uh, baptized at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Exactly. So, uh, you know, if you don't if you don't become <laughs> baptized in this life, that's okay because later on when you die. Say it, um, dog. <laughs> Tell me. We Tell can. Me what, uh, what to me. <laughs> somebody will eventually, at some point, get your name. Uh, and you know, now we only do it for people that we can find, you know, trace within our own family tree. But uh, it'll get, they'll get to you eventually, at some point. <laughs> right. Because either you're somebody in your family will join the church later on, or you know. But you know, later at the same when, time, you know, it's really. I, I don't. I guess on a religious level, there's harm there, but in the reality of it all, and I hate to say in the reality of it all, but yeah, it's harmless. You know, it's really kind of like these people yeah. who are saying, "I'm going to pray for you." It's like exactly. Great. I don't believe in your God at all, but pray for me. That's nice of you. Thank you. And that's that's how we view it. We view it as very harmless. It's like okay, these people died without you know either they didn't know about christ or they just didn't know about the truth and so mm-hmm. we're going to baptize them with the proper authority after they're dead they can accept it or reject it we're not it's not a forced thing it's it's it gives them the opportunity in the next life to now accept or reject that baptism because more- baptism I'm sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, real quick. So baptism has to be done by immersion in water, and you can't do that after you die. You have to have a physical body to be baptized. Mm-hmm. So it has to be done on the earth. So even if you, we believe in the next life, there's a waiting period before heaven and everything, and there's missionaries there that'll bring the gospel to you. And so if you accept the missionaries, you accept the gospel, you learn the truth, and you want to follow it, but you can't be baptized because you don't have a body anymore. So we do that for you on the earth. So now in the next life, you can accept that baptism that we did for you by proxy and it becomes valid and then you can go to heaven. Hmm. So, yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, it's and, definitely, um, it's a, it's a nice thought. There's yeah, you know, not, again, there's no, there's no harm in it really. Yeah, and I, I agree. Like we, that's how we view it. Is like you know, we're just giving you the opportunity if you want to accept it. But when other people uh, out of the church look at it, they they view it as we're converting everybody to Mormonism after you're dead. And so, and I could see why people would take offense at that. Right. Um, I mean, you know, the and so yeah, the Orthodox, we don't quite view it that way. The Orthodox Jewish Jews and the um, Hasidic Jews are a lot more strict. And I would imagine that they would say flat out, no, you know, like we don't want to be, you know, um, thought of in the, um, you know, baptized and blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and, and all that um, stuff. It's not their belief, you know, it's, it's so against it. So I I really see both sides of the thing on on that particular thing. Um, but yeah, still, so, I'm still I'm not really here. I'm not really seeing Mormons as being like this really kind of um, scary organization. But I know that there have been things that are a little bit more um, sketchy going on. Just like probably all religions, there's something. Yeah, definitely. And and I guess that's the distinction I should make. Um, you know, people that don't uh, grow up around the church, and you know further away like you being in you're in new york right yeah um there's a lot of tv shows about the polygamous mormons and all this stuff and so Mm -hmm. the current church there's a lot of different break-offs in mormonism the the main church uh is pretty kind of mainstream not really too many weird things go on it's uh you know, there's the polygamous groups. Those are break off churches that uh, that most people that are in the Mormon Church try to stay away from as much as possible. Try not to associate with them. You know, they think they're this complete outside group. Um, but there are different groups of Mormon of Mormons technically because there's those break off groups that uh, are maybe more fundamentalist and things. And so a lot of the you know, when people talk about crazy Mormon things, a lot of it might be some of that stuff, some of the break-off groups, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it can get lost of which one they're actually talking about. 
Um, so also, but, you know, like people refer to, um, they, they use the phrases interchangeably, um, Mormons or LDS or Latter-day Saints. Are they yeah. all the same thing? That's all the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's funny you mention that because we tried to as a church we were counseled for a long time not to refer to ourselves as Mormons because that was associated with polygamy. <laughs> oh yeah. And so they said, don't refer to yourself as Mormon. Call yourself a Latter Day Saint or uh, don't or talk about the... big love. <laughs> exactly. <It> was... <laughs> Which was a great series. I think. Yeah. I don't know how I... accurate it was, but I found it entertaining. Yeah, and that's again, that's a break off group, so it's not, you know, it's not mainstream Mormonism. Um, but yeah, and so we tried to distance ourselves from the Mormon name for quite a while, and then, you know, more recently they've embraced it because that's how everybody refers to us. So yeah, now they've embraced I mean, <laughs> it, and now they advertise that way. So yeah, um, around here we, you know, we we'll, both are correct. Yeah, we don't really get Mormon um, people in general, like walking around, we'll get from time to time Jehovah witnesses. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Who a little bit pushy, but you know, they're, they're for the most part polite. Yeah. Um, and you know, I love getting into a conversation with them because I'm pretty much getting them to roll their eyes, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, the, it's, you know, it's just kind of interesting, the whole door knocking type of thing, you know, and yeah. I know the Mormons, and um well the latter day saints they it's part of your it's i'm saying you um it's part of your mission right to definitely recruit i guess or to, to spread the word of exactly Mormons. so yeah jehovah's witnesses are a little different because every oh, member very different. yeah yeah every member of the jehovah's witnesses i think are expected to go knock doors um, in Mormonism, uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's, uh, it's the missionaries that do that. And you get, yeah. you, you serve a mission typically, uh, now they change the age. So around 18 or 19, uh, if you're a man and women around 19 or 20, I think, um, will go serve a mission. It's typically two years. And for those two years, you basically, uh, completely dedicate your life to nothing but teaching the gospel uh, to people wherever you're sent. So and you're outside, sent... Of, outside of the experience, what do you get mm -hmm. from that? Um, what do you I get, mean, you get from to... it? Well, I'm saying, uh -huh. is the goal when you're doing this to to learn as well? Or to get better at, you know, preaching? Oh, yeah. Or... So the main goal is to baptize people into the church. That's the number one goal. And how often does that happen? How often do you walk into, you know, a Baptist house or a house that's you know doesn't have, uh, you know, maybe a faith um, that everyone agrees with, and they're yeah. like, you know, hey, give me some of that literature. You know, does that happen often? It, well, yeah, it all depends where you serve. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, New York, you're gonna get a hard sell no matter where you're going. Yeah, yeah. So like South America, they convert quite a bit. Uh, you know, Europe is much tougher. Uh, in the U S I don't know exactly, uh, like you said, different areas are tougher, but, um, and where was your mission? Uh, I served in Poland. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so I moved. That's exciting. When I mean, you're young, you go to Poland, you know, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And that's, you know, I actually really enjoyed my mission. I loved it. Um, great food. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. The food was great. My ancestry is Polish, so oh. I loved you know, kielbasa, I love you know. <laughs> meeting my, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> hundreds of varieties of kielbasa. Well, that's almost like a military type of thing, you know, it's like, oh, you go there, you travel the world, you can um, the spread exactly. the word of your faith. Yeah, uh, I learned to speak Polish, uh, wow. you know, uh, it was it was a great time, I really had a lot of fun, I really enjoyed my mission, you know, a lot of people hate, hate their missions. Because they, they feel like slaves and stuff. And, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it all depends slut. on where you go. But uh, but I actually really liked it. You know, in Poland, we did a lot of... Um, I didn't do so much knocking doors there because it wasn't very effective. So I just talked to people on the street. We taught mm -hmm. free English classes, uh, you know, different service projects and things to just help people out and try to teach them about what we believed and... Right. Uh, I had a decent amount of success, um, you know, baptized some people there and, uh, but you know, it, I don't know how many 
baptisms the church does in a year. I think they said this last year there was like a couple hundred, like 200,000 maybe. But the church is um, a big church. I mean, we're not talking like, yeah. um, we're not talking about Scientology where there's 20,000 active members, which no, and that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a real number, you know, a, which is 20, nuts. 20,000. Yeah, yeah, like 20,000. Yeah. I mean, that's like How do they have so much town. money with yeah, that's pretty small. Yeah, that's but, like a, um, that's like a Huey Lewis concert. <laughs> yeah, <there> um, <laughs> well, back in the eighties, but mm-hmm. you know the um, we're talking about millions of people, right? I mean, we're ta- we're not talking about even hundreds of thousands of people who are part of the. Yeah, it's a pretty. Saints. It's a, I mean, it's a global church. It's it's pretty much around the world. Um, there's, you know, we say fifteen million members. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's, you know, ex Mormons, of course, will say, yeah, but only, uh, you know, half of those, maybe half of those are actually active members, people that actually still believe in it and still go to church and all that stuff. Still but seven and a half million people is, but um, still, I mean, that's a, yeah, it's a significant group. It's not, uh, it's not a small church by any means. So at um, what point do you start, I guess, um, well, you said you you were reading more and more about the history, and it really wasn't, I guess, jiving with you well. And you yeah. had kind of a, an awakening. You you thought this is this is inaccurate. I, I feel as though I've been lied to in a lot of ways, right? Definitely. And um and w- was it like an immediate like all right, screw this. You know what? I, I went out, and that's it. Or is it like is there a process? Is there um. Like, you know, immediately you get taken to a room and your whole family gets taken to a room. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that whole process. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, with Mormonism, there's there's a lot of talk of whether or not Mormonism is a cult or not a cult. And we could talk about that maybe in a little bit here. But, um, you know, if, when I when I had that experience that I talked about where I realized the whole thing was all made up, mm-hmm. um, I just said, okay, well it's completely made up everything. And, uh, I'm like 99.9% sure of that. Uh, so I'm just not gonna, I'm not going to go anymore. So I just stopped going to church. Uh, I didn't have to meet with anybody or do anything. Um, my Bishop, who's the kind of leader of the local congregation, uh, the bishop, you know, after I stopped showing up for a little while, was yeah, like, they're hey, like, "What's going on? What's going on? Are you okay?" And they're very nice. I mean, great, great people. You know, he wanted to meet with me, make sure I was doing okay. You know, wanted to help me out if I needed help with anything. Um, it wasn't uh, like, "Hey, you need to come back to church." It was just like, "Hey, is there anything I can do to help you? Like, what's well, you going do on? Hear can we talk stories. about this." From yeah. other organizations, not, you know, not, uh-huh. I haven't heard anyway from anyone, um, within the Mormon institution, the, you know, there's nothing like that, but in other yeah. things, which have been called cults, you know, they completely take it as an aggressive action and they yeah. return their aggressive action. You know, yeah. Like I, I watched that Scientology documentary going clear. Yeah. And, I mean, they, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's they're like tracking people and videotaping them and all this crazy stuff. I mean, Mormons, Mormons would not ever do anything like that. It's when, when you leave the church in Mormonism, instead of people, uh, following you around and threatening you, they do something called love bombing you. And that's <laughs> where it's like a glitter bomb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, like, yeah. You could show up, uh, you know, you can come home from work and there could be cookies on your doorstep and a no. And like, I hope you're doing okay. You know, let me know if there's anything we can do to help you Get out. Get these or... freaking cookies out here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know, people make food yeah. for you. They'll, you know, they'll start visiting you. Is there anything we can do to help you out? You know, it's very, uh, it's a very loving group of people. And, you know, there are those stories of maybe the bishop that's takes things upon himself, takes it way too seriously, and maybe yeah. does some things that aren't appropriate. Um, and when you get on the ex-Mormon sites and things, you'll read some of that stuff of like, oh, my bishop did this and this. And, uh, you know, there's some people that have well, had some maybe aggressive things. But, yeah, exactly. And, you know, when in you general, do something like leave, they're going to take it, you know, some people are going to take it as an aggressive action and have road exactly. rage type of reactions. And that's it. It's different people react differently. But 
me personally, I mean, I've had maybe one bad experience in the church my entire life and not really that bad of an experience, just kind of a minor thing. Mm -hmm. But I've had nothing but great experiences in the church, amazing people that I've associated with. I mean, I still have, you know, when I was a, uh, in the young men's program at, you know, you start, you start the young men's program at 12 years old, 12 to 18. And I have a leader, uh, from my young men's program that lives in a different state than me now. He still calls me every single year on my birthday to see how I'm doing, make sure I'm, you know, just doing well, see if he can help me with anything, give me advice. Like, I've had nothing but great experiences with the people in the church. See, everything um, you're talking about, and it's interesting because you're coming from a point of view where you've left the church. Um, is your whole family out of the church as well? Uh, I, mean, not, no. I mean, your immediate family. I mean, like your wife and no, my wife is uh, still uh, oh, okay. in the church, and um, does she give you the stink eye, kind of like? Hey. Yeah, it's a touchy <laughs> subject uh, right. <laughs> because the church is kind of an all-or-nothing thing, mm -hmm. and you know, one of the core tenets of going to heaven is that you're sealed to your spouse, and if your spouse no longer believes in the church, that can kind of, you know, throw a wrench into your eternal salvation in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, all things will be made right eventually. But yeah, it's a sore subject. And it's kind of gotten to the point where we just don't really talk about things a whole lot. Uh, so, I right mean, now, everything you're but, uh, kind of talking about, though, really, a lot of people do compare um, Latter day Saints to a cult. They do, um, yeah. And when you, a lot, you'll find a million websites out there that explain why it's a cult. But they don't really, really touch upon why. I mean, for the most part, I see it as kind of a basic religion that has a different philosophy, philosophy and different beliefs. Um, that kind of is um, a branch of Christianity or Catholicism, even. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see it as as much of a cult because you don't have contracts. You don't. I mean, do you have to pay money? To be a member? No. So, yeah. And, and that's why I think using the word cult to describe Mormonism is maybe a little bit harsh. Yeah, I, um, I actually agree with you a lot on that. I just don't... So but you, I, under, you I do understand you why people... One. Well, it can go both ways, and I'll talk about that, because I, I knew that question would come up, so I prepared a little bit for that one. Okay. Because it, it does kind of go both ways. Like you said, there's not some contract that I... Well, there we, is, but not, and, and we'll get into that. So, like I said, I can just leave and stop showing up, and that's fine. Oops. Nobody's going to harass me. You know, they might send the home teachers over to kind of visit me and make sure I'm doing okay, check up on me, you know, that kind of thing. But from my experience, it's all been based out of love and mm -hmm. not not like trying to force me to do anything. It's all people that care about me. Uh, that have reached out and, and tried to help. So you don't get that. Um, but, uh, you know, calling it a cult, yeah, there's there's not that, you know, some people have different experiences. But uh, so I looked up uh, what the definition of a cult is. It's a very Mormon thing to do to define <laughs> words here. So, uh, you know, one of the, the first things that I found uh, – under the definition of a cult, it says a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object. So in that sense, you could consider it a cult because we believe the prophet, you know, speaks directly to God. And, and in Mormonism, even though the members will deny it, it's kind of you somewhat worship the prophet because whatever he says is like, you better do that, you know. Right. And uh, see if so, I were to define cult, I would think that it's, um, you know, a faith-based understanding that is intentionally created to mislead people mm -hmm. for whether it be power or money. I mean, and, and that's, and the that's exactly line. yeah, and that's why a lot of ex Mormons will say, "Oh, it's definitely a cult," because we were lied to our whole lives about a lot of the true history, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things that 
the church knew about, they hid, didn't tell us about, you know, so we were lied to about a lot of things. And, you know, we did pay uh, a good deal of money into the church because tithing uh, or donating to the church, we call it tithing, you Mm -hmm. know, comes from the Bible and everything. And tithing means a tenth. The definition of the word tithe is a tenth. Now, is that in the Bible, though? Uh, tithing is in the Bible, yeah. Okay, I'm not so There's sure. uh, the Malachi, uh, the end of Malachi, it says, you know, bring all the tithes into the storehouse of God, and, w- you know, God will open the windows of heaven, something like that. I think like they that. meant, you know, more along the lines of food. Exactly, <laughs> and that's exactly how it started in our church. Originally, it was food, yeah. and it was the storehouse to help people, you know, you, you donated some of your food to help those that didn't have food. Right. But eventually, I think it was around the 1930s, if I remember correctly, the church, uh, there, maybe it was before that, I'm really bad with dates, but at some point, uh, basically, the church uh, was having all these issues with polygamy, and the U.S. stopped recognizing the church as a church, I think, and they had to reorganize, and then tithing became... T- be, at some point, tithing became donating money instead of food, and so it, it became interpreted as a, you, you donate a ten percent of your income, and so and that's why people will say it's a cult because you have to donate ten percent of your income if you want to go to the temple, and the temple is one of the other central tenets in the church because the temple is the only place where you can get sealed to your family and do some of the ordinances that are necessary to go to heaven. And you can't go to the temple unless, you pay, unless you're a regular full tithing payer, so you pay mm-hmm. 10% of your income every year. Um, if you don't do that, you can't go to the temple. And so you have to pay that basically to you know, be worthy of going to heaven. Now, what and, do you know about mm-hmm. the... Um, go, I guess going another 100 years back, this is when... This is, I think, eight years after the um, first um, writings were published, the Missouri Executive Order 44, or the Extermination yeah. Order, which, yeah. you know, it's funny, because um, just as you were talking about I'm like, wasn't there something about Mormons being killed? And it, Definitely. it became illegal to be a Mormon. Is that correct? I mean, it That was, is correct. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it was like about killing them, and... Yeah, they were so like Mormons, the enemy of the state. <laughs> yeah, they were. They were. So you know, we have this. It's uh, crazy. You know, and growing growing up Mormon, you learn about all this history, and and we were taught it in a way of, man, we were just so persecuted because we were just trying to bring back the truth to the earth, and Satan was fighting as hard as he could to prevent that from happening, and that's why all these bad things happened to the early Mormons. Uh, and when you read the history, you realize, oh, no wonder all this stuff was happening because the Mormons were taking over the city. They were threatening people. They were burning stuff down. I mean, they were doing all these things. Yeah, it was they, like they, a they complete brought it defiance on of law. <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely brought it on themselves, which I learned reading the history. But all growing up, it's like we were just persecuted because we were trying to be good people. <laughs> but, um, yeah, in Missouri, what happened was at some point, uh, there was a lot of tension between the Missourians and the Mormons because, you know, this is the this was the uh, front line of the West. You know, beyond Missouri was just uh, Indian territory, um, just open expanse. So it was kind of the border of of the territory. So it was all these kind of rough people that lived there that were trying to escape the more East Coast type of uh, situation, I guess, trying to be more free or whatever. And, um, and the Mormons come in, this huge group of Mormons come in, start taking over the town and they, they're teaching and preaching about how, you know, this area is the center It's going to be Zion and we're going to take over Zion and this is going to be the city of, of God and all this stuff. And so the, the Missourians were kind of getting freaked out yeah, that the Mormons like were going to take this over. Yeah. And eventually, and the extermination, that was one thing that really surprised me reading the history. The first person to actually call for extermination and to use that word was a Mormon preacher named Sidney Rigdon. He was in the presidency of the church. He was the first counselor. So 
he was the man next to Joseph Smith. And he, during all of this uh, fighting and everything, he said in a, in a sermon, he said, it's going to be a war of extermination between us and the Missourians. And pretty not too long after that is when the extermination order came out, you know, kind of, I think somewhat as a response to that, it's like, if it's going to be an extermination war, then that's what we'll have to do to get rid of you guys or something. It's also, it's an interesting piece of history because it's one of these things that is, it's out there if you want to learn it, but it's really not something that is taught. And I feel like it's, it's kind of an important part of our nation's history. Yeah. We actually, you know, um, literally turned on our own people based upon religion. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's... Mormons, yeah, yeah our, our whole history kind of gets thrown under the bus as like something. Uh, you know, like, I met with that atheist group recently, and they said, oh, you were a Mormon? Like, didn't you know Joseph Smith was just a complete bullshitter? Like, how did you not know that? <laughs> you know? And, right, now you uh, look at it, and you're like, eh, okay. But at the yeah, same time, now yeah. I'm like, oh, now, now I know all this information that every Everybody else in the country outside of Mormonism, like, oh yeah, it's just this guy that made up all this crap and you know whatever. So and right now, but you, there's you, a lot of interesting sorry. history there, though. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Um, I was gonna say, so, so right now you're really kind of just doing your own thing. Um, do you consider yourself like a spiritual person or just a moral person? Or yeah, I mean, I I didn't really change much of my morals. I don't think, uh, you know, I still believe in uh, a lot of the same morals that I had. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's I not don't like you're an anarchist believe... all of a sudden. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that's, see, but that, that is the viewpoint that we're taught our entire life, is that if you leave the church, you're going to become this kind of like, devil worshiping horrible person involved in all the things of the world and and it's going to ruin your life and you know mormon you got to follow the mormon rules to have a good life otherwise you're just going to be lost and sad and depressed and have a crappy life right you're misled and, and you're just completely down spiraling exactly out of control. yeah you'll be in the control of satan and and your whole life's going to be ruined and so it's a very scary thing to even think about leaving the church and a lot of a lot of mormons don't ever get into the history or even start down that road because it's it, that fear is deeply ingrained and uh and you know that's part of where the whole cult thing comes in after you get freed from it you realize wow i really was kind of in this fearful mindset and now that i'm out of it i realize how poisoned my mind was in you know looking at people that weren't mormon as kind of maybe somewhat lesser or that they just they didn't have the truth and they're not even though they look happy they're not really truly happy because the only way to be truly happy is to live this religion Mm -hmm. and so it's a very scary thing to even start down that road yeah it's, uh, it's tough because when um I feel like there's a lot of people on the, on a high horses in all religions and they, they look at yeah. everyone else is misled. Um, one day you'll come around and all of that type of stuff. And, uh, you, you know, it's really, uh, not what it's all about. Exactly. And, and, you know, within Mormonism, I, I had a long conversation with my mom the other day. Uh, she's still a devout believer. Um, but, there's lots of different ways that you can take things, uh, in the church. You know, they, they'll teach certain things about loving everybody. And so you can kind of pick and choose and say, yeah, we accept everybody. We love everybody. Uh, but then there's other times where they'll teach things about how the only way to be happy is in the church. And, you know, you need to try your hardest to convert everybody. And, mm-hmm. you know, so there's these different perspectives that you can take, in the church. And I realized, you know, the reason why my mom still believes is, is because she picks and chooses, you know, the good aspects and the the things that cause divisiveness, she kind of ignores or kind of pushes that to the side and doesn't really focus on it. 
I feel like, you know, in general, as people, we have to do that in a lot of ways um, to just survive. You have to kind of accept what you want to accept and move forward and, I guess, leave the negativity or the things that you don't agree with behind you. um, Exactly. And when you get onto the ex-Mormon groups, it's kind of the opposite. Because after you've left and and you're angry that you've been lied to and you're angry about all these things, then you kind of do the opposite take and you focus on all the negative aspects. Which there's quite a few as well. You know, there's a lot of negative aspects to the church. And so then, you know, ex-Mormons will typically focus on that. And, and it seems you know, to be a very well-financed operation. Um, mm-hmm. I think that a lot of people, at least from what I read, have a very um, strong bitterness towards the amount of money that um, or maybe the way that the church uses the money. I'm not I'm not 100 percent clear on all of that. Yeah. Um, but I, I know people really seem to be really, really upset over the money aspect. In Definitely. Yeah. And we can talk about that for a minute. So yeah, the, uh, you know, like I said earlier, uh, you're basically required to pay 10% of your income to the church. If you don't, there's no penalty for it, except that you just cannot go to the temple and you're not really considered worthy. Oh, really? Um, so I didn't yeah. know that. So you're not allowed to. You're a member, but you're not allowed to actually go. You can go to so there's different there's the church buildings and then there's the temples. So the they temples, pay to pray. You know, I mean that's essentially it. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Wow, I, I mean you can that. you can be a member and not pay your tithing, but if you're not paying your tithing, you can't get your temple recommend and you're not considered uh in good standing. Mm-hmm. Um and and you're not allowed to participate in the temple ordinances, which are super important. Um, so, and you're not technically worthy to be saved. And so, you have to pay 10% of your tithing or your income. Uh, and in the temple, you actually one of the promises you make when you go through the temple is that you consecrate your time, talents, and money, and everything you own to the church. Um, now that's not something we actually do right now, but it's something you promise to do in the in the temple. And so, uh, you know, that's that's something that comes up sometimes in discussions at church. They'll talk about like, you know, you promise to consecrate uh, everything to the church, and uh, so even though that's not what we're living, we're not living that law right now. At some point, it could happen where all of a sudden we have to turn everything over to the church and follow the prophet and do whatever he says. You know, that's always the option that's on the table that could happen. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. Um, so it's, you know, and people donate a lot of money throughout their life. And when they leave and realize they were lied to their whole life, I can definitely see why the anger comes out. <laughs> Do you have um, friends who followed your path out? Or uh, maybe are questioning it now that you left? Yeah, so I have, um, you know, some of, there's... Uh, two family members or they're uh, like that are that idiot (laughs) no two family members that are uh, similar belief as me I think Um, but the rest of my family is all still um, active believing members I haven't really discussed things with all of my family like all my brothers and sisters I haven't had you know really deep conversations about that with them Um, but with my parents I have uh, I've had some friends that, uh, you know, some friends that have left and some friends that have not. Um, now, you and know, I, I was on the um, Reddit ex Mormon uh, mm-hmm. Reddit, and you know, there's forty two thousand members there, um, and yeah. let's say maybe ten percent of those people are just spies. So thirty eight yeah. thousand, um, they re- they refer to themselves as recovering Mormons. Yeah, and yeah, that's a lot of people. All right, granted, it's a tiny percentage of the um, ten million. Yeah, or or I'm sorry, whatever it was, and but it's at the same time, and also you know, it's just the people who have sought out Reddit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a lot of people. You know, to kind of be pissed off enough to go online, and there's countless, you know. Um, 
blogs about, you know, being an, you know, ex Mormon, they each seem to tell a different story. Yeah. Um, some of the stories are extreme, you know, there seems to be child abuse in some sex of it. And, um, but you know, it doesn't seem to be consistent through, I think like any religion, when you have, you know, powerful roles with adults, there's abuse. It just yeah. is. It's a sad truth. Um, and that goes for all religions. Yeah. It's just, um, it's a lot of pissed off people. And I'm wondering, do you think that this might be, um, I don't know, a be like kind of an exit of, of Mormons. Do you think there's, um, a large portion of people leaving this faith or is it just, uh, has it always been like this? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think in the church there's kind of been multiple stages of kind of, you know, larger amount uh, amounts of people leaving the church. But definitely right now, uh, definitely a huge, huge escape from Mormonism. Uh, lots and lots of people leaving the church. Um, the reason being is uh, a couple of things. I, one of the biggest ones I think is just with with more information being available online and easier to find uh, the church cannot hide their history or the issues any longer right. and so people are uh, it's much easier to find these issues um, from the past and and that's all again that's only because it's roughly 200 years old. <laughs> you yeah, know, you take yeah. you take Judaism it's 3500 years old. All of the nonsense happened centuries ago. Exactly. You know, so you, you really, you know, you can't recall um, you know, a large portion of Mormon's existence has been, you know, in the modern time. So yeah. you know, we we have every printed magazine, we have every article scanned somewhere. Exactly. Um, it's in. It's probably for the most part, its entire modern existence exists online. Pretty um, much, which yeah. is kind of unfair. Um, if you're going to compare that to an ancient religion, or even you know Catholicism or any of these things, there's really no way to track it from you know 800 years ago or something. Yeah, yeah, and and all the information is out there. I mean, there's still some ambiguity with things around Joseph Smith because you know the records from that specific time are kind of uh, hit or miss, and a lot of things he didn't write directly. He had scribes and all these things. But but yeah, you're right. I mean, most of it can easily be found. There's really good records from early church uh, sources. Um, so you can track all these things as they change. And, you know, one of the core beliefs is that God doesn't change. Maybe the things that he requires of people changes over time, but God doesn't change. And then when you read, uh, all these issues and realize, man, God either (laughs) is, you know, uh, what's the word like bipolar or <laughs> something's <laughs> not quite right. I mean, he's just switching left and right back and forth. And yeah, something's so what, full of shit is, here. And it's yeah, like... <laughs> exactly. Where, where's the actual truth here? And you can track that a lot easier in a, in a more modern church. Truth and religion um, are just two things. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, they shouldn't be in the same realm. There's this yeah. faith, there's truth and there's faith. There's something you could feel and there's something that actually happened. And those two things go. don't always, you know, connect. That That's interesting that you say that. I've never even thought of it that way. But you're mm-hmm. right. I mean, and that's the thing in, in the Mormon church. They are one and the same. Truth and faith are, are kind of one and the same. Like the, the Garden of Eden was a real, actual place. Adam and Eve were real, actual people. The flood was a physical thing that did happen to the earth. It wasn't just a, like a... A theoretical thing. It was a real thing that happened. And you know, there are like, parts of Judaism and, where people believe that as well. You know, yeah, like the, they take yeah. these stories as literal stories, and it's like, you know, no, yeah, it's, it's exactly. a story. It's, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, a, yeah, it's a life lesson. <laughs> exactly. There's good lessons that can be taught from Just to these scare things. you. That's it. <laughs> exactly. The book of Ezekiel has a UFO sighting. Is that, you know. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. That's a, that, I always go to that for all my UFO friends. So. I don't know that one. I'll have to. Oh, look really? That up. Yeah, look yeah, up Ezekiel. Yeah. I forget. It's right in the beginning of Ezekiel. But okay. they basically describe a UFO. 
It's yeah, amazing. Okay. A circular disc flying with fire and lights and it's oh, pretty yeah, it's wow. pretty awesome, man. And and that's you know, that's the interesting thing about the Mormon church, like I said kind of at the beginning, is how the 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 aspect of the church is that we take all truth and that Mormonism encompasses all truth. Mm-hmm. And so everything that's out there that's true, whether it be science or things from other religions or anything that we learn that we know to be true somehow fits into Mormonism and you can make it work. Although sometimes you have to do uh, some pretty hefty uh, lifting or bending over backwards to make it fit. You can make it all fit somehow. And uh, so it's appealing that way. But uh, and then when you get out outside of that and you realize, oh no, it's all just, it's all just BS, and and uh, none of it really fits, really. <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I always thought that the Amish were Mormons. Oh yeah, um, uh huh. I mean, I don't know why I thought that. Um, I can I'm, maybe tell. Well, I can tell you an experience about that. Oh really? Yeah, I I love. Going, I we spend time in Lancaster very uh-huh. often. Every summer we go up there, and we love it up there. And the Amish people are very nice. If if they're real Amish, they could be just you know doing it to sell their pickled eggs to me. But, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know. But you know they have the you know pretty flourishing you know economy there. You know from for tourists like me, and yeah. and you know it is it's an it's an interesting thing to see that they're all Trump fans too, which I I thought was oh, really interesting. Yeah, man, I went up there before the I election. Guess that makes sense. But... And um, it was every like every single farm had Trump signs everywhere. And wow, um, you see like the buggies with like a Trump sticker on it. I, I didn't expect that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so when I was in my my time in Poland, there was a movie that was popular. Um, with Harrison Ford called The Witness. Yes. And where he goes and stays with the Amish, right? Yeah. And he's like on witness protection or something, goes and lives with the Amish. And so at at the time, that movie was really popular in Poland. And when they translated the word Amish into Polish, they translated it as Mormon. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And so every single person in Poland that I Mormon. ever talked to, pretty much, <laughs> I uh, said I would. I was Mormon. They're like, "Oh yeah, how come you're not wearing your hat?" And where's your beard? How come you're you're using... with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you don't use electricity, right? And you know, do everybody... you have any brothers named Jebediah? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So they like, thought you we were Amish. Yeah. yeah. So everybody in Poland thought that we were Amish polygamists. So That's they'd funny. ask me about the electricity, and they asked me how many wives I had. And did you and... <laughs> did you at all play along a little bit? Just go, uh, yeah, sometimes. I mean, I you know, we joke culture. about it. But, I think it's yeah. interesting. You know, it's uh, they don't have electricity um, for the most part. They do have some electricity. But, you know, they don't use natural gas. They use uh, propane tanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they have to have it, like, delivered. You know, like, do you have a gas grill at home? Like, you know, a regular yeah, gas yeah. grill? You know, you have the little white tank. That's, like, exactly. you know, maybe five, ten gallons. They have big ones, like big, like hundred gallon tanks of those outside of their oh, house. Oh, okay. And they have refrigerators that run on gas and actually create. Really? Yeah, it's a really interesting. Technology. I did not know that. I'll be a, I'll, <laughs> I'll be a, um, a, a Mormon slash Amish one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just gotta marry a couple more women and um, uh... <laughs> a Mamish. <laughs> there you go. But, um, you know, that, that was, um, I do think that the Mormons have gotten, they get attacked so easily online, it seems like, um, they do. there are also a lot of really weird, uh, how do I say, um, like you'll get a Christian website and they'll say, you know, 15 ways the Mormons are not. And it's, oh, yeah. it starts going into, they believe that this is such and such. When we really know that it's Jesus that is the blood of blah blah blah, and it's like you're just as nuts. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Like, and I don't mean to call anybody <laughs> nuts. It's just you're talking about the same thing. You're talking about you know your Jesus character 
rose from the dead like a zombie. Like, I don't... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's zombie I mean... Jesus, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and then... I, I don't understand, uh... really, all of this stuff, you know? And when it really comes down to it, Jesus was a rabbi, so uh, I, I feel good with that. Yeah, there you go. He was a teacher. No, I, I think if people should choose a religion that fits them and suits them, but they shouldn't feel as though they have to choose one way or another or feel as though the religion alters their life in any way negatively. Yeah. Just never do that. Um, I agree. And, and that's the hardest part for me leaving the church. You know, I left the church kind of out of principle because in the church, it, it really is kind of all or nothing. It's like, this is the truth. And this is what you have to do to go to heaven. Otherwise you're lost and you know, you're wrong. But what about your kids? And yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. (laughs) Um, If you don't mind me asking, how old are your kids? Like, uh, I have, uh, three, three boys, two, four and six right now. Two, four and six. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's tough because what I've missed the most about the church is that kind of community aspect um, yeah. You know, meeting with people, making friends there, kind of having these activities together. Mm-hmm. Um, all, that, all that stuff is, is really good about the church, you know, people see, helping each other. See, that's and... why I'm part of my own personal, you know, why I follow Judaism because of that, uh, yeah. of the community of it. Um, do you, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with, well, like you said, you have to be all in. So, I mean, you can't really think kind of, yeah, I mean, and there is this, there is a whole group of Mormons now called the new order Mormons. And it's kind of people maybe that have similar beliefs as me, but they try to make the church work still. Mm -hmm. And so they still go to church. They still do everything trying to make it work, even though they don't believe it. Right. But it's very hard to do. And a lot of them try it, uh, and it doesn't work because, um, you know, let's say you're, your kid turns eight years old and it's time to be baptized into the church. And, you know, if you do that, it it means certain things. If you don't do it, it's, you kind of, you know, looked down on, like maybe there's something wrong with this family. Like why aren't their kids getting baptized or what's going on here? And it's not really a pick and choose type of religion. It's kind of an all or nothing thing. And it's for those new order Mormons, it's really hard. A lot of them really struggle yeah. And I think eventually leave the church because it doesn't really work. Um, and so, you know, for me at this point, I'm uh, a lot of me is trying to look out and say, okay, is there some other kind of group or I hate to call it a church even, but that's probably what it'll be called. But is there some kind of organization or group or church that we can go to as a family to have this community, to have this togetherness, uh, this helpful aspect but not have to believe in these dogmatic all or nothing beliefs yeah. and and be forced to pay 10 percent of my income and all this right. stuff you know see that's like, it's like the non-denominational type of thing it's just yeah. the matter the problem that i think that i have with that is you just get a lot of people who just want to talk about what they did instead of what they want to do it, it, yeah. like they want to talk about all their regrets and oh really yeah um yeah. you know it, it's like when you do meet um a lot of new atheists or uh-huh you know they just want to talk about well i did this i did that I, yeah and it's like yeah. you're not looking for a support you're looking for a sort of a support group but not like that you're looking for a community yeah, like something to be involved in where you do good in the community. Um, you know, you have a well, group of we, people to We belong go ahead. to the Cub Scouts as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, I was a I'm an Eagle Scout, so Are you uh, really? Yeah. I mean, the the church is very into Cub Scouts. Uh, I did that as a My when kids I was a younger, bear. So. He's a bear yeah. this year. I'm one of the leaders. And Are you? That, yeah. That's crazy because it's that I was like kind of um roped into and uh-huh. I didn't realize how how involved you get in with the community. Like this oh, yeah. week, we're this weekend we're doing a sleepover on a battleship, like the Intrepid that's in Manhattan. No way, and that's yeah, cool. it, yeah, and it's super pricey. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> yeah, crazy. Um, but you know, it's one of these things. It's um, 
we have like 60 kids, not 60 kids. We have 30 kids and 30 parents and we're all going to go there. and We're going to have this great time. It's going to be a great bonding experience. And we're talking, you know, it's a very big mix as well. I yeah. mean, you have, you know, Catholics, Christians, Jews, Orthodox Jews, and okay. um, we don't have any Muslims yet. Although we do have, um, they're coming, I'm sure. Yeah. But we have well, a matter of time. We have a mosque actually in our town, which is one of the things you don't expect to see when you drive through. I, I live in a town called Hewlett. And okay. it's a very, very Jewish area. And uh-huh. it's just like out of nowhere, it's like, Five Towns Mosque. It's like, whoa, what's that all about? Huh. And, uh, but no, they're good. They're decent people. They're good community. They're, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just the way this entire country is going. You know, we're getting more and more um, um, mixed. And yeah. I, I guess that's good. But you you said you're in Utah? Uh, I live in Southern California now. Why did I think you're um, in Utah? <laughs> I, I grew up, I was born and raised in, in Utah and Salt Lake that's City, right. so. Um, oh, you're in California just, just, now, so. Yep, Southern California just recently moved out here, so pretty new out in, in this oh, area. So you can go get an In-N-Out burger and you'll be good to go. Like, oh, you know, yeah. All, all yeah. your problems go away when you get an animal-style uh, <laughs> burger. Oh, yeah, you know the animal style, <laughs> oh, too. Yeah. That's, that's, the only, that's the way I get it every time. <laughs> I lived out there for a short uh, stint. In, um, oh, did you? Probably the most crime-ridden area of L.A. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, um... I lived across the street from what was referred to the rock and roll Denny's where all the hookers oh. used to hang out. Wow. And, um, yeah, it was a cool place. It was very salmon colored apartment building. And, um, okay. You know, there's a million of those out there, yeah. but you know, LA, LA is a tough town. Yeah. I'm in the, I'm in the South Bay area. It's a little more relaxed. Yeah, It's a little bit nicer. A, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a nice spot. I like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love, laid I love back. California. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it. I think that you know you, you do have to stick with your gut with a lot of this kind of stuff, and um... yeah, it's tough. Like like Boy Scouts is something that I really want to be involved in. Um, are you are your boys? Um, well, you're six they're not old this. enough yet, but you know it's something that I, I would I think I'd like them to be involved mm-hmm. in. I loved it as a kid. I loved hiking and camping and all that kind of stuff. I think your six year old um, might be old enough for next year to be a tiger. Yeah, I think you're right to start Cub Scouts. Yeah, I think my kid's right. in his third year doing it, and he's eight. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's yeah. probably starting soon. And actually, they believe it or not, they even um, do. They have one that's earlier. They're just introducing. I don't know if it got to the West Coast yet. I'm forgetting what it's called, but it's for kindergarten. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's um, it's cool. You know, it's like you get these cute. You know, it's cute. Instead, yeah. of the, instead of the kid playing soccer where he's like picking up rocks and put, filling up his shorts with rocks, <laughs> he's going to go on a, you know, a mile hike or de, you know, learn about composting or something. Exactly. It's, it's so much better. And it's, this is, this is my sexist comment of the day. Um, it's where boys can be boys. You know, it's yeah. it, where it's just okay. I mean, granted they've opened the doors so girls can join, but boys can just, go and get dirty and do boy things and, yeah. and kind of, um, you know, he, my son loves it. So yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah, it's, right. It's, with any of yeah. your kids. Yeah. And I, th- I think my kids will love it. I mean, we, we go camping with them and stuff and cool. And, uh, but that's, and that's something I struggle with. You know, the, the Mormon church is very involved in boy scouts. I and never knew that. So, I mean, I guess, I oh, guess, yeah. I guess depending on where you go, it's, you know, um, there's even a Jewish um, aspect to um, Cub Scouts, anyway. Oh, yeah? I don't oh. know about Boy Scouts. But, yeah, they have special, you know, what do they have now? They have the uh, sliders for the belt now. They used to have oh, yeah. beads, uh-huh. but, you know, they've retired the beads. Yeah, yeah. Mormonism is very, I mean, everybody that I knew growing up that was Mormon was in Boy Scouts. And mm-hmm. uh, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. And uh, it's part of every church group that I've ever been to there. There's a scout program. My wife um, was immediately saying no. Cause she was like, isn't it Catholic? You know, I think that uh, a lot of people associate the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts with religion. Um, yeah. Cause I think usually it's kind of church groups that, uh, yeah, we meet in a church. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's how, I mean, 
all of my scout meetings were all at our church all growing up. So see, when I was a kid, I, I was only up to I went to being a weeblo. You're, you're okay. like weeblo, but uh, Weak sauce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like nice giving up. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I was like running home to watch Joni Loves Chachi instead. I, was like, I can't <laughs> go to these meetings and watch TV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's um, yeah. So we meet in a church and all this kind of stuff. But um, to actually to bore you a little bit on our thing, we found out recently that the pack that we have it's called Pack Twenty. Okay. Um, it's not a troop anymore. It's um, oh yeah, it's a pack. I think when Cub Scouts are packs, and then when the Boy oh, Scouts are troops, troop. yeah. Okay. But we date our actual um, pack dates all the way back to 1917, which was one wow. of the original ones. Yeah, and there's a you know we have Theodore Roosevelt's house here on Long Island, and he's standing on the lawn with one of the um, one of the. Um, troops from back then it's actually troop 20 so i just thought that was kind of hmm. cool yeah that is pretty cool yeah so we we kind of opened everyone's eyes to that we had like our little blue and gold thing a yeah, couple weeks yeah. Ago. <laughs> but you know well, like things cool. like that like all right i have a jewish background you have a mormon background and this is where we kind of connect you know it's like where we have a bit of rapport and that's what i kind of like that's the kind of community yeah. maybe you're looking for also is like exactly. what can, where can everyone kind of meet in the middle yeah, and, and it doesn't yeah. matter your beliefs, you know, right. that's totally out of the picture. It's just like, hey, let's, you know, get to know each other, let's help each other out, let's have these groups together, get together things, let's do some right. community service. And it's possible that uh, the Mormons were developed or invented or created for that reason, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the Mormon church is really good at doing that. The, the downside uh, with the Mormon church on that aspect is... There can be a lot of uh, sometimes there can be some shunning or that type of thing when you if you leave the church or you don't really you know believe it anymore or that type of thing. Right. Lots of people have different experiences leaving the church. My family is very understanding, loving, caring. You know, it's like, all right, that's what you believe. Okay, I mean, this is. I think maybe you're wrong, but that doesn't change anything between us. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, some people leave the church and their family disowns them and they're kicked out of the house or, you know, lots of lots of extreme stuff. And uh, and that's why you'll see a lot of angry ex-Mormons as well. You know, I mean, they've been kicked out of their house and disowned by their family. It's crazy. So, yeah. I mean, it, it boggles my mind because my family has never been that way. But right. I could definitely see how that occurs within the church, but yeah, um, I, I, I mean, me kicking out my son, you know, that's just nuts. I know. Parents. I can't even imagine kicking out one of your three kids. <laughs> I know. Like, I, I can't even. Ugh. Yeah. I don't even know how that's possible. That's why we'll be better parents moving forward. Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> exactly. But um, Ian, I want to. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, this chat. You've opened my eyes up to a lot of the Mormon uh, ways. And um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm walking away with the same kind of feeling I had in the beginning is I don't really think of the Mormons as being too. I'm not going to say it's a cult. I'm going to say that it's realistically just their own belief system. It's their, which is essentially yeah. a religion. And. Um, I don't know. I just don't see the cultish ways, at least yeah. in comparison to other more extreme, um, unnamed yeah. Source, you know, places. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and that, again, that comes from my perspective. You'll probably get some people that'll, uh, there'll probably be a lot of ex Mormons maybe that rip on me and my perspective because I didn't maybe cover some of the more cultish things. Uh, you know, a lot of them were in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole like polygamy and uh, there used to be an oath in the temple where you'd slit your throat if you ever told anybody about it. And so there's definitely some cultish things that are there. Uh, I think yeah. it's more so more so in the past and in in general, like you there's said, there's always I think, skeletons in the closet of religion. Exactly. Um, exactly. I, mean, I know with the Mormons, they had a bit of a racist um tinge to the uh to where black oh, yeah. people came uh -huh. from 
Yeah, that's a and that's a very big issue. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's, it's very eighteen thirties racist. Um, oh yeah, definitely. But you know, at the same time, it's um probably completely a normal way of thought two hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, For a it, white man, yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of followed the prevailing thoughts of the time, but delayed by maybe 50 years. <laughs> you, know? you don't dig enough <laughs> into any religion, you're going to find skeletons. Yeah. True, true. And we know that. I mean, we, we accept it, I think, also. It's just, um, even Scientology, you know, these religions are new. They're, you know, and it's hard to take things seriously when they're new. Granted, you know, being a, you know, Mormons are less than 200 years old. It's still a very long time. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said. Um, if you want to attack something, I guess Scientology or. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, you con- know, that's what I was thinking when I was listening to your Scientology episode was, you know, all these people that leave, of course, they're mad because of all the, the issues. But, I mean, they were in the church for a certain amount of time for some reason. I mean, they mm-hmm. weren't forced to be members. Uh, you know, same with people that are Mormon. I mean, we weren't forced to follow this. I I did it by my own choice because it kind of worked for me for a little while, and I believed it. And, yeah, maybe I was brainwashed or whatever. But, uh, I mean, I believed it, and it worked for me. I loved uh, a lot of aspects of it. And then, you know, I mean, people are Scientologists for some reason it's i mean they're not forced to go there well you know um right. i think it was Ma- ron miscavige was interviewed on the joe rogan podcast the past couple of weeks oh yeah and he's the dad of um i forget his first name the other miscavige that runs scientology he's like oh, the big, really? you know he's like the big yeah, kahuna. yeah and so the dad of the leader his dad and he claims okay. to be have been forced <laughs> Really? It's an interesting interview. Actually, okay. Joe Rogan interviewed um, Leah Remini um, a couple uh-huh. months ago, which was a fascinating um, piece. You know, actually, her book is pretty good, too. Um, her show is... I find Scientology kind of amazing. There's something about it that I find fascinating. It, it um, is interesting, for sure. And I've gone really. into the center out in L.A. and Oh, really? I... I don't know. They, I mean, they didn't force me to stay or anything. They invited me okay. in. <laughs> I'm too afraid to even get my name on their roles because I don't know. I didn't give my real name. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after watching that episode, I'm like, I'm never giving them my name. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, have but, you? Have, uh, do you have impure thoughts? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, man. Again, thank you so much for getting together. Um, yeah, I'd love anytime. for you to come on again. Yeah, we do these once in a blue moon. We'll have this little round table thing, like okay. the Scientology episode. So, yeah, I mean, it was great, if you ever want to come talking on, man. to you, uh, great getting Thank to know you. you a little bit better. Yeah, man. Uh, anytime, and and maybe in the next time, I'll I'll tell you all about uh, the connection between Jews and Mormons too. There's some interesting stuff there, but <laughs> but no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for uh, for <laughs> volume two. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but yeah, it was great talking to you. Yeah, man. Thank you so much.